This podcast exists for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. Why do I use exists twice there? I don't know. We'll have to live with it. In a tented field hospital during the Crimean War of 1856, a nurse finds herself in an argument with a surgeon. Where do you come off questioning me? You're just a nurse. Oh, pretend I didn't hear that. I'm not questioning you. I'm just telling you to wash your bloody hands. Watch your language, Florence. But your hands are literally covered in blood. Of course they are. I'm a damned surgeon during a damned war. These bloody hands and blood-soaked smock are my testament to my work. Patients see them and... Mistake you for a butcher? It's pronounced surgeon. Honest mistake, really. All I'm driving at is that if you'd all wash your bloody hands and change your clothing, maybe all these soldiers wouldn't catch fever and die. Do you realize what the mortality rate of this field hospital is? I don't see the significance of the number. Well, I think that's part of the issue, to be honest. Don't you suppose there might be a relationship between the unclean conditions of this hospital and your practices with all of the men around here dying from illness, if not their gunshot wounds? Look, my colleagues and I are sick of you following us around and incessantly telling us to wash our hands. We are not children. We are surgeons, and we certainly don't take advice from nurses. Wash your hands. No. Wash them. No. Wash them or no rations. You can't do that. Okay, don't wash your hands. What? I insist you no longer wash your hands. I decided your grubby, pus, and blood-soaked hands are perfectly suited to take care of clean wounds now that I think of it. In fact, I think I shall follow you around to make sure you're not washing your hands in between patients. I don't take orders from you. I'm the surgeon. If I want to wash my hands, I'll go ahead and do so, as often as I want. But that would make me so very angry. Please don't wash your hands frequently. I'll show you. I'm going to wash them so much. Ha! (sighs) That child. Oh, well, I'm sure he'll be quick to adopt evidence-based practices in the future. I should have shown him the pie chart. Nothing drives the point home like a good pie chart. What about pie? Nothing. Don't tease me about pie. Don't wash your hands. I'm going to wash them right now. (sighs) That's probably exactly how it happened, too. Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, do you have a favorite body part? <laughs> Ooh, can I answer this one first? Uh, it rhymes. Yeah, let me hold on. I'm going to start the edit. And go ahead. <laughs> it rhymes with. <laughs> All right, there will be, I'm sure, a beep right there. Uh, and Aaron, how about you? Or b- <laughs> Nope, Aaron? <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer this question. I need a frame of reference. Just say b- No. You know, you know body parts. What's your favorite body part? Uh, 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 snuff box. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to say the what? snuff box. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. You it's know what a body part. You can, you can, I mean, you can do coke out of it, plus you got to check for it. Right. Things there. that Aaron knows yeah. right off the top of his head. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he likes to snuff people in his basement. Most <laughs> listeners, you know, actually it's a nice high end because I was going to say my favorite part, it's got to be hands, right? Like hands are the most useful thing. They're just, they're so useful. And the snuff boxes, like if you splay out your fingers along your thumb, it forms a little bit of a box there. And as Aaron said, you could. It's cool. It's like not there it. and then it's there and then it's not there and then it's yeah. there. And then it's then not Max, there. describe the body part that i said that i liked (laughs) so moving on in veiny detail (laughs) can hands deliver the seed of life oh my gosh so many so many edits why did you start with this question 
no reason. Oh, goodness. All right. Shout outs. I think we need to give Becky RN a shout out because we've gotten good feedback on our uh, new sign off catchphrase that she suggested. So, Becky, much appreciated. Nicely done. You stepped Becky. up to the plate when nobody else did, including the three of us on this podcast. That's right. So there's that. And then another shout out I'd like to give. This will be coming up in the near future, but uh, big thanks to the Drunk Wisconsin History Podcast. We were interviewed by their show and will be featured on their 100th episode coming up on April 17th. We'll post uh, to that effect and advertise as we get a little bit closer, but we had a really good time talking with those guys and really appreciated them having us on the show. Yeah, that was super fun. They really get it interviewing. We had a good time. I think we will probably be working with those guys in the future. That is certainly our hope. So big, uh, big shout out there. Much appreciated. So, and with that, one more nice little reminder for listeners. We really do appreciate We have received more uh, feedback. We've received yet more listeners as we keep going. So please keep telling folks about the show, posting it wherever you want and incessantly bothering people. That's what I do at work uh, when it comes to the show. So I just appreciate everybody else helping me with that. And we can tell it's actually working. So we do enjoy that. Well, with all the nuts and bolts of the business out of the way. What are we going to be talking about here, Aaron? Well, not to pander to a, a certain group of our listeners too much, but I got to say there isn't much in the world stronger or fiercer than a, a badass ER nurse. I don't know if I can still say that that word, but I mean, it's refer- reference to a donkey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Saying bad or ass? <laughs> you can <laughs> say d- in d- on TV. You might as well be able to say ass. <laughs> Good, Good <In> point. <laughs> oh, okay. This That's is not the way I expected this so intro to go. I mean, you know, I was, I was thinking to go in a different direction, but Mike's in rare form this morning. I definitely will echo that, though. I, I, I can think of some stories from in my past working with ER nurses that... Like for instance, uh, in my hometown, the there was a fairly infamous bar that was on the ma- main stretch of uh, the town, and a lot of folks didn't go there unless you were part of a fairly rough crowd. And there was one night that a, a contingency of nurses from the emergency department where I worked at the time <laughs> went down there and managed to get eighty sixth from the bar. That usually is where <laughs> many of our stabbings and shootings in that town tended to come for tended to come out. from. Is that what you call a group of nurses? Are they a contingency? <laughs> I think it's like a murder of crows. I mean it's better than calling them a murder uh, of flock of a, seagulls. A pathway. I think it's a pathway of nurses. A care yeah. plan of nurses. That's what it is. But yeah, that was uh it that was actually pretty incredible to get kicked out of one of the most violent bars in my hometown. Yeah, yeah that's they're a, a rough bunch. That's impressive. So I say this by way of introduction to one of the most famous nurses in history, Florence Nightingale, who was... Oh, the, per- the progressive commercials. <laughs> no, that's just Flo. Hey, maybe it is. I don't. They never go into her last name. Oh. Uh, she was absolutely a, a badass nurse, blazing a trail for many who came after her, and who in typical Victorian fashion was given the title, quote, founder of modern nursing by Wikipedia. Um, and a lot of her uh, contemporaries, they might have, you know, I don't know if that's entirely accurate, but uh, nonetheless, a giant in her field. She was like seven foot four. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So at least maybe, maybe eight feet You meant tall. metaphorically. Yes, it was a metaphor, but okay. you just got to spell it out. Makes it better that way. Explain she, your jokes. <laughs> they always sound better that way. She was uh, born in 1820 in Florence, Italy, and took her name from her birthplace, but was back in England by 1821. Wait, she named herself? Uh, she moved back. She made her way back. I don't I don't know. No, no. She no. named herself. She named. She took her name. Well, that's what people say. The, so maybe, her parents what was her named name her. before that? No, that was. Like Tr- Trisha Rosebud Her or something parents like named her after the city oh. she was oh, born okay. in. There I'm really go. glad I wasn't named Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, me too. Although I wasn't born in Detroit, so that would have been Detroit weird. Cuddle Puddle. <laughs> Hi, hello, my name's Detroit Cuddle Puddle. Nice to meet you. I am Detroit Cuddle Max. Puddle. I demand respect. <laughs> Somewhere out there, there's a there's a Gary backseat of the Oldsmobile. <laughs> <laughs> have you guys ever met Doctor Provolone? <laughs> no, Doctor Provolone is my Italian uh, doppelganger that sometimes shows up at work on shifts, <laughs> usually night shifts. I'm a little oh, punchy. 
he always tells you to eat your lasagna and that the sutures are too tight. <laughs> You did a nice job. You did a nice job. Are you sharing an inside joke that you have with yourself? (laughs) No. Hey, listen. There will be some people that know. They (laughs) they have personally met Dr. Provolone. (laughs) Why didn't you finish your lasagna? Those sutures are too tight. (laughs) Anyway. It's an inside joke. You might as well just bleep all that out. But there are a few people that are going to know exactly who Dr. Provolone is. Oh, absolutely. Is it you and Dr. Provolone? Yeah, it's... It's yeah. a split personality. And, and for first time listeners to the podcast, <laughs> let's try to get back to that story. Given what we've learned from the 1800s, we can say she was fortunate to be born into a Unitarian family that valued education. And that's not a comment on Unitarians. It's the valuing education part. Wait, what is a Unitarian? Uh, it's a uh, hippy dippy religion that loves everybody pretty much mm. and is multi-denominational. I think communism I think super inclusive and yeah, uh, very, very inclusive. Communism's not a religion. That's, <laughs> um, and uh, hippy dippy, I say with love. So, Is it like Pastafarian then? Uh, oh, totally different. I can, hmm. that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> Sorry, I we're not even through the first paragraph. I'll stop talking. <laughs> I've got some tea. No, no, right? it's okay. It's okay. So she was trained in statistics and science and all sorts of subjects by her parents. And as a a rich kid, I assume tutors, but, uh, you know, because of that, she had a very privileged upbringing. She bounced around European and English society circles, but didn't really accept her prescribed role, which was sort of a, you know, just to be a woman in that age, which didn't have much of a prescribed role. And at one point stated that given the choice between a high society woman and a galley slave, she would choose the latter for the freedom, broadly dismissive of high society's expectations. Although, you know, I I don't think she knows how freedom works. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't know if that comment aged super well, but she was trying to. And if she was on Twitter, she'd be (laughs) destroyed for that comment. Let's cancel her. Let's use this. Mm hmm. Uh, She did study nursing during that time, but also traveled as far away as Greece and Egypt. Um, There is a definite tension, no disrespect intended between her rejection, quote unquote, of English upper class expectations and career. But her family was supportive enough that her father paid for her posting at the Institute for the Care of Sick Gentlewomen in London. So she wasn't happy with how she was raised, but they seemed to help her have all these experiences. So where did the sick, rough women go <laughs> <laughs> to prison probably, or maybe no. Bedlam or who knows? Not... Okay. Let's not investigate that further. <laughs> Look, see past episodes through these informal, but extensive studies. She was prepared for the war that made her reputation, which was the Crimean war. The Crimean war is a crazy war that went from 1853 to 1856 and involves like no countries I can easily recognize in their modern form. It, Tsarist Russia against, okay, France and England maybe, but they were different. Sardinia, the Ottoman Empire, they were all fighting over the control of Christian minorities in Palestine. So I guess some things don't change. Did the Ottoman Empire, they were known for stools, right? <laughs> uh, Gray stools. <laughs> they all had pancreatitis. Comfortable stools. Frothy stools. Two different jokes at once. I'm very confused. <laughs> the players are appropriately Byzantine. So coming to Netflix next year, I assume, is a period drama. And the war itself was a predecessor to World War I in that it was horrifically brutal. There were sieges and charges and failed invasions and stalled campaigns, all sorts of stuff basically around the Black Sea, which is just south of Ukraine. Um, it was considered one of the first modern wars fought with naval shells and telegrams and some modern mus- munitions, similar to the Civil War, without a clear plan. Uh, technology allowed a huge jump in how many people could be killed at once, which resulted in massive casualties. How did they weaponize the telegrams? <laughs> I think that was not weaponizing it as much as just communicating quickly. So it would became much more of sort of things that mm. people would follow day by day. Okay. They, follow the progress and they can communicate over long distances about what was happening. It's just part of the modernity. It's all Morse code though, right? It's got a, I don't know. I don't know how that helped. Anyway, Florence took off for the Northern shores of Turkey to help out and found appalling conditions. What the listeners to this podcast would expect from the middle 1800s, of course, filth and pestilence and death, mostly from infections. 
because of all the social circle work and travel she had done for the preceding decades, um, she was able to mobilize a lot of the English aristocracy and implemented hand washing and other sanitary improvements in the medical hospitals supporting the war. Oh, boo, hand washing. <laughs> I know, right? But that was the big way that she fixed things. I'm having a hard time. We've had all these hand washers. Like, when do they all, maybe we should do a timeline of the hand washers. Is it all about the same time? Uh, yeah, similar times. I think this would have been contemporary to Lister, if maybe a little bit ahead. They definitely, uh, there will be a future episode coming, but they definitely do draw upon each other. In fact, yeah, in a, absolutely. a book I just read about Lister, th- there is certainly mention of Florence Nightingale trying to get people to wash their hands. Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's all about the same time. So there, And there was a huge amount of pushback to both of them. There's pushback to Lister, which I'm sure we'll talk about more in that future episode, and then here as well, there, there was a fair amount of pushback. But really, she just came in and said, yeah, maybe you should be clean. Um, also help figure out the, the water supply and so on. And there is a figure that states that she lowered the mortality in the hospitals from 42% to 2% um, through a variety of reforms. That is maybe still argued about. So if you happen to be a Florence Nightingale scholar, you know, there's, I will allow that that's not entirely perfect, but, but she made a huge What was decrease. the P value? Was it, did it meet statistical significance? <laughs> oh, good. I don't want to Probably. P values. Probably. I don't know. Uh, Correlation does not imply causation. Well, but this phylogeny is, is does not recapitulate genealogy. <laughs> <Wait. laughs> Ooh, nice jokes. Yeah. Yeah, it was Linnaeus, wasn't it? Phylogeny recapitulates something. <laughs> Aaron, what's your opinion on the matter? Uh, I try to stay out of it. Okay. Yeah. I just do what the nurses tell me. Don't discuss taxonomy over family dinners. That's correct. Maybe, yeah, maybe it was taxonomy. Well, whatever. So Florence <laughs> herself, perhaps due to the use of the telegram to give quick updates from the front, went viral at the time as the Lady of the Lamp, um, which became a Victorian motif for this caretaker nurse figure. Um, a reporter at the front noted that she had been seen as a ministering angel, taking in the suffering of three armies and performing night rounds with a candle checking on the soldiers. I, who knows if that was all Florence. It's hard to say. It could have been, maybe. Um, this image took on the full weight of Victorian imagination, though, and she became this just this personification of mercy for the sick. But yeah, I mean, you know, whether she did these rounds herself or not, she certainly was on the ground trying to take care of all these soldiers. Yeah, so three different, I'm, I'm assuming all, probably not the enemy's armies, but all the allies in the struggle. Yeah, and I, I don't, you know, I looked at the Crimean War for a bit. I can't tell you who. It's the Brits and some others, <laughs> probably. Sard- the Sardinians. Yeah, who knows? Like Dr. Provolone. Hey, we lost the war. We lost the Crimean War. But the West <laughs> got a lasagna. <laughs> I don't think Italy was in there. Or is that it is. I don't know. For any Sardinians <laughs> listening that are offended, I apologize on behalf of my partner. <laughs> When someone gets famous like this, it's likely others will suffer or at least get jealous. So there remains the 1800s version of a Twitter war with the head of the Crimean hospital, Sir John Hall, who called out the, quote, petticoat imperium, unquote. Except um, he said hashtag petticoat imperium. <laughs> that's, that's right. Where Florence ignored the medical establishment's needs, apparently, and in his recalling, tried to take control of the whole thing. Um, <laughs> At Florence Nightingale, stop telling us what to do. That's... Hashtag petticoat imperium. Rudy woo. Hashtag bloody hands. She also apparently feuded with Mary Seacole, who was an Irish nurse who ran a a hotel for the injured officers. That seems like it might have had some questionable overtones or that Seacole was not accepted by Nightingale because she was Irish. Wait, what was that hospital's mortality rate? Uh, it's not stated. It's no. not stated. Yeah. A lot, like of, little, a lot of little deaths. Say, there were, there were a lot of little deaths is, is what, oh. what it was. Okay. Either way, the myth of the Lady of the Lamp was incredibly powerful and, and probably went a long way towards establishing modern nursing. Uh, well, what's that noise? Is something wrong with the time portal? I don't know. It's, it's monitor turned on. That's, that's weird. Oh, turn some knobs. Okay. <laughs> Why are we turning knobs? Turn the knobs, please, Mike. Turning knobs. 
Are you sick of suffering from diarrhea, dysentery, or cholera? Do you feel your vital forces have been weakened? Are your digestive organs in a bind? You need Valentine's Meat Juice. It's a proprietary blend in the loosest sense of the word. Chock full of meat drippings and who knows what other mystery ingredients. It's guaranteed to restore your vitality and unimpair your nervous disposition. Just ask Professor Von Ranke. As long as I was in practice, I not infrequently prescribed Valentine's Meat Juice. Now that I am old and am myself a sufferer, I take a teaspoonful of Valentine's meat juice at each mealtime and find the preparation palatable and strengthening. There's no reason to suffer from any malady. It's 1910 and the future is here. Take Valentine's meat juice. It's definitely medicine, sort of, for sale by American and European chemists and druggists. Take Valentine's meat juice at your own risk. These statements have not been evaluated by anyone who knows anything about anything because the FDA won't have the authority to evaluate these claims for another 28 years. Was that an advertisement from 1910? Yep. Yeah, that's what that was. Weird. Why'd that happen, Mike? I don't know. Solar flare, probably. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> wait, wait, does it though? Really? I believe you were talking about Florence Nightingale and the Crimean War, Aaron. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose. I really love these frequent interruptions. I mean, come on, guys. All right. Anyway, back to the serious matter. Are you arguing with the time machine? Like... The time machine kicked down. What do you want us it's to do about it? It's not a time machine. It's a time portal, man. I, I apologize. <laughs> I did not mean to offend you, sir. I okay. still don't think it's real. I don't believe it. It's some you just saw it. Uh, yeah, you know, a lot of it's hard to believe your eyes anymore in this day and age. It's absolutely real because uh-huh. I built it <laughs> with my own bare hands. <laughs> no tools. Just using analytical analytical chemistry. Uh huh. Totally weird. <laughs> Emilimical. <laughs> anyway, back to our story. It's pretty clear that the initial fatality rate of the military hospitals in the Crimean War are anywhere from 42% to almost 60%, mostly That's from bad. dysentery, cholera, and typhus. My favorite disease is from Oregon Trail. <laughs> dysentery. <laughs> they, they all get you. Somewhere in a middle school classroom on an Apple IIe that they somehow didn't get rid of. <laughs> there is a member of my party going to Oregon that is buried who died of dysentery. Yep. With the little, that gave you the little tombstone. So up. many, so many computerized tombstones with cuss words on them. <laughs> like Perfect. which ones? All of them. All the words you're not supposed to say. We used to put them Ofa. on. Like, every time your person buried. died, you get to like write in on the tombstone on the game. So they're oh. just, and the next person playing the game would sometimes come across the tombstone. So it was a way to communicate <laughs> with your fellow classmates that you learned how to spell cuss words. And nice. it was it's a first hilarious Easter to egg. put them in the computer because yep. they're not going to be able to wipe that stuff off. Come on. Nope. Dysentery, of course, being more of a general term for infectious bloody diarrhea and cholera, we all know is a waterborne bacterial disease. Um, typhoid, we haven't talked about much, but it is a bacterial illness also related to water issues and hygiene. There's a pattern here. Yes, yes, there is. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for the time. You know, Napoleon's invasion of Russia failed in large part in the same era due to horrific infectious disease. But that drop to 2% or so of fatality is, is pretty well documented and large and relates in large part to water management and the establishment of functional sewer and food processing reforms in addition to the hand gene, the hand gene, in addition to gene? hygiene and hand washing. You should just call it hand gene. What a it's... nice tie in to our first episode. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is a circle. Weaving a giant tapestry here. Everything is a circle, just like fecal oral transmission. Just. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> after, after the war, she used her fame to establish the first nursing school in England and wrote the foundational book on nursing called simply. Notes on Nursing, which was published in 1859, along with her school, which opened in 1860. These reforms inspired the nurses of the Civil War in the U.S. and allowed nurses to take the place of informal care that existed until then in the home and institutions around England at the time, primarily in workhouses where uh, paupers took care of each other in poorhouses across England. Yeah, I guess my, my impression, and I don't know if this is actually true, but my impression is just if somebody could sustain being in that environment they could be a nurse there wasn't a lot of formal training it seems yeah, to be the case am, like, am i wrong there do you know i i didn't see a lot of formal training at all previously um you know there was there's a whole tradition of midwives that goes back into the middle ages but that was very different yeah nurses were i think the people that would suffer through taking care of the sick um often related to religious orders and such but yeah it 
this was much more professional. But I thought nursing was the world's oldest profession. No, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> isn't it? Woo, I'm not touching that one with a ten foot pole because I yeah. still want to work on Monday. <laughs> Oh, just a quick segue away from that. Um, yeah, the, the workhouse system was a set of institutions where those too poor to sustain themselves um, after the Napoleonic Wars of the early 1800s and the mass conversion to industrial agriculture left a huge portion of the population destitute were forced to provide unpaid labor so that the welfare system wasn't abused. So, yeah, I mean, it could be, I don't know, that's just another terrible thing I found in history. There's a so lot basically of stuff. the wars ravage the economies and folks returning from war who don't have jobs or base or kind of forced into. Yeah. Yeah. If you, uh, couldn't take care of yourself, if you couldn't take care of yourself, you had to do unpaid labor for other people. It seems a little backwards. Wait, but then, you, but then they provided you healthcare and food. N- no, I don't. Well, I don't think they did really. I, mm. I, <laughs> Maybe shelter. I don't know. I don't think so, it was a good yeah. system. Yeah, no, not saying it's great. Maybe one of our listeners knows more. Nightingale's work spread to the U.S. via Linda Richards, dubbed America's first trained nurse, um, and Australia, as well as throughout the U.K. after her work in the Crimean War. Her book, Notes on Nursing, is 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 really well written and still seems almost hilariously relevant today. There's a joke you'll sometimes hear, which is kind of dark and dismissive, about what RN stands for: refreshments and narcotics. Because a lot of nurses these days feel like that's all patients care about. And in fact, there are whole chapters about these aspects of care with regards to food and fresh air and helping patients cope with their illness and so on, which, you know, still is somewhat relevant. It is. It, I would say it's still relevant. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. said somewhat. I said I shouldn't qualify. It. Which Very means relevant. that Aaron thinks that comfort no, and no, good no. environment are <laughs> of minimal benefit to patients. I didn't say that. You could put a waterfall in the entryway at least. I mean, come on now. <laughs> in addition to that, though, there there is a keen clinical mind at work. One of her chapter titles is, quote, average rate of mortality. So she, she points out at one point that the average mate rate of mortality tells us only that so many in the hundred will die. Observation must tell us which in the hundred will die, which, you know, is a good point. Um, she has a whole section on how important observation of the patient is with regards to sleep and diet and so on. Noting correctly that people tend to omit details or follow leading questions either due to lack of attention or modesty. Wait, wait, wait. If, if observation is so important, why do insurance companies kick and scream about paying for it? <laughs> Good point. You should just send them a copy of that book. Yeah, I feel like, you know what? I'm just keeping up with the standards. She says, quote, if you cannot get the habit of observation one way or the other, you would better give up the being of a nurse, for it is not your calling, however kind and anxious you may be, end quote. Yeah, I, I think, you know, she's got a point. Nurses are the eyes and ears of any unit, and a, a priceless nurse will know regardless of what the patient says if they're sick or not. That is very true in our environment when you're going patient to patient and or trying to juggle many patients who are various degrees of sick or unstable. Having nurses that can recognize when things are changing and alert you is absolutely, truly priceless. And they don't come up and they say, oh, this patient said X or Y. They'll come up and they'll be like, this patient looks sick. Go in that room right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. On the way. Well, no, you should say, well, go in and observe and report <laughs> back to me in three hours. <laughs> you try that one next, Dr. <laughs> Provolone or whatever your name is. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Provolone could be like a recurring character. <laughs> yeah. It, it Dr. should Provolone, be. It well, should it is be. at work. Well, he is let's at work. just, let's bring him into the pod. We should invite him on. We have a guest spot. She was a pioneer in graphical representations of data, too. She made beautiful pie charts and polar area diagrams for statistics related to mortality rates and so on. Uh, well, more than 100 years before PowerPoint, so she had no help doing it. Um, and <laughs> used these for recurring arguments in favor of sanitation and water management and hygiene in general. I want to make a pie chart from scratch. It would be so hard. Yeah. <laughs> angles and percentages. Yep. Need a protractor, probably. She is literally all over the history of modern nursing. The Nightingale Pledge is a modified version of the Hippocratic Oath created in 1893 and used mostly in the U.S., interestingly, um, pledging, among other things, to avoid knowingly administering any harmful drug and to hold in confidence all personal matters and family affairs. Hmm. So she established the Florence Nightingale Faculty for Nursing at King's College and International Nursing Day is celebrated on her birthday every year. Hmm. 
Yeah, perhaps because of all this work, she remained unmarried throughout her life. Um, and some scholars even believe she remained chaste throughout her life. She did have some very close friends, including Mary Clark, an English woman she met in France in 1837 and maintained a correspondence with throughout her life, as well as Sister Mary Claire Moore, an Irish nun she worked with in the Crimea. Like Elsa and Frozen, she often thought of herself as strong enough to have no need for relationships and sometimes referred to herself as a man of action or a man of business. She was even on the 10 pound note in the UK in the 90s, and she has an asteroid named after her. Um, nice. Awesome. <laughs> I know. Number 52 on the list of famous Britons with statues across England. She is a titan of medicine. Wait, I thought she was Italian. <laughs> Florence. Well, that's fair. Italy could probably claim her. You know, she was born there. She died peacefully in her sleep in London in 1910 at the age of 90, after which her family declined burial at the famous Westminster Abbey in favor of a simple plaque with her initials and dates of birth and death only at St. Margaret's Church in Hampshire, England, if you ever want to go pay homage. Oh. so I, I like that. Simple, mm -hmm. just uh, understated, and yeah, it's a, nice, uh, it's a nice little capstone there. Yeah, it was uh, one of the few kind of essays I went through and didn't find some horrible secret hidden somewhere in the middle. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of refreshing. Feels weird. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's mostly refreshing. Anyway. And to read, yeah, to read or hear a lot about this stuff that she had done. I mean, it sounds like our practice. It sounds like like she started HIPAA, essentially. Yeah. You know, like I mean, it, yeah. being confidential, opening right. to questions. She, she did our H&P. <laughs> yeah she did yeah all. she's like no no i have yeah, it open-ended questions it takes so no long. i know i know oh, how many though. bowel movements did you have like mm -hmm. she, she just... well you want to see a picture <laughs> i got a picture of it look there's a little blood in the toilet <laughs> when did this start well i was born in 1936 <laughs> oh, no, no, not, not you least. not you i've seen that patient many times oh, all so right bad. well you know that is all we have for today we appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. If you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistorianspod.com. There you can find links to all of our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistorianspod at gmail.com, and we work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review on whatever platform you choose. That does help our show grow, and it doesn't take much effort other than some clicking and probably writing a lot of nice things. I mean, it's some effort. I'm not going to say it's not some effort, but we would appreciate it. But if you're old-fashioned, make us a mixtape. Express your feelings towards the show and send it to us. We'll appreciate the time and effort you put in on that one. So until next time, Poor Historians are signing out AMA. Pretty sure I could hear Aaron blinking there. What? Hmm. Turn my turn. <laughs> That's gross. It was just so it was so quiet. All right, episode twenty-three. Disclaimer. <sighs> wait, 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 wait. What was the last mixtape you made? Do you remember oh, any songs on it? <clears throat> it's. It was probably in middle school, and it was a collection of ska songs. I'm fairly sure. Nice. But mixtape can still be a CD. Remember, when, like yeah, when but yeah, it can burn CDs. Yeah, yeah, but it's just I don't know for some reason mixtape or even made cassette, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean I can't remember the last time I did a mixtape. I think I had a, a mix of songs I recorded off the radio. Oh yeah, there might be some Bon Jovi songs, maybe. It's all nice. playlists now, which isn't fair. I mean, it's you not, gotta. It's not, it's not fair. You, you get gotta hear all mixtapes. You get to sit there and wait for the song to start and then super fast hit record like while you're mm -hmm. listening to the radio. Right, That's right. Or even burning a CD. Like if you burn a CD for somebody, you have to go through your collection, find the song, put it in iTunes. You had to yeah. have the physical copy because you couldn't. That, you couldn't. That reminds me. My audio download. broke up a few times. Let me turn off my Napster. Ah. Like my dog. My dog had diarrhea and she loves to poop on my stairs that are carpeted. That's the only place she takes down. Oh. There's like... I need new carpet. <laughs> she had colitis. Oh yeah, that that mm -hmm. particular my I will say meant not many things make me queasy to smell or odor, 
but when our dogs had hemorrhagic colitis last year, oh god, that the, sounds the terrible. smell from it, I was mm-hmm. retching, and I do not. I I can eat, and I have eaten oatmeal while somebody is like actively barfing mm. within five feet of me because just. No, an oatmeal is oh, a tough one, too. It's already got but... kind of a questionable texture. Right, right. No, but I mean, that doesn't bother me, and I can smell the vomit, and it doesn't well, bother me. And even, no. like, bloody human stools don't bother me that much. But this but dog, luck. bloody diarrhea, brought me to my knees. Oh, yeah, that'll I do I can't it. see, hear, or smell puke. If I do, no? it's over. Yep. Yeah. Are you one of those but, people who gets, like, triggered when people even fake retch? Sometimes, or yeah. it's the smell. That's what we do are like family gatherings like we'll eat thanksgiving dinner let's say like right after dinner my brother will start fake barfing because my mom's the same way <laughs> so then everyone's like oh, oh, oh. it's gross oh and no, i see you yeah you talk about your family you make a lot more sense i mean that <laughs> I'm learning, we're learning more about Mike Break as we the go. Of my mind. Yeah, I mean, but I, yeah. I, many times I'll come out after even doing a rectal exam and eat a Cliff Bar, which, if you look at it, really, especially if you squeeze it a little bit, just looks exactly like a, you know, a nice Bristol Four. Maybe that's the audio clip for the show. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, gross, gross. Yeah, <laughs> that what does not do bother is so me. Gross.